بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله hope everybody is doing well um, so inshallah we're going to spend a little bit of time just talking tonight about preparing for ramadan and the way we're going to structure it is we'll first start by talking about the virtues and the benefits of the month of Ramadan just to kind of help get our mindset refreshed a little bit uh, since obviously it's been it's been about a year uh, and then inshallah we'll go ahead and talk about some of the uh, goals of this blessed month and then some of the spiritual work that we should try to intend as we get into this month and then we'll finish off with the uh, the thick the kind of a very high level overview of some of the rules of the month of Ramadan um, and of fasting. And then we'll have time for a question and answer. Uh, so the one of the most important things to remember about the month of Ramadan is it is, while it's a month of fasting, there's a lot more that's going on in the month of Ramadan as a means to try to draw the believer closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know that the Prophet والسلام, told us that when Ramadan enters, when the first night of Ramadan enters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala locks up the shayateen and the jinn. And he locks up hell entirely. He locks up Jahannam. And the Prophet told us that no, no door of hell is left open. And he says then, he opens all of the doors of heaven and not a single door is kept shut from, of Jannah, of heaven. And that there's a caller that calls out that tells those people who are seeking good to come forth and to encourage them to, to, to do good. And those who are seeking the opposite of good to do, to do something wrong, to stay back. Right. And then the Prophet told us that it is a month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves a lot of people who may have originally been going to the fire from the fire. And so the first thing the Prophet is telling us here is it is a month in which the forces that pull us towards our, our angelic nature, the, the heavenly nature that's inside of the human being. Remember that Adam alayhi salam, father Adam alayhi salam, was created in, to be in Jannah originally. And so those doors are all open. That pull should be happening. That magnetic pull is happening. And the lower forces which pull us towards our lower self, our, our, our nafs and the, the shayateen that are present, those doors are closed. And so we now have to know, okay, it's really up to us how we're going to approach this month because Allah is making it a lot easier. He's saying, I'm going to make it easier for you to stay away from your desires and I'm going to make it easier for you to do what's right. And then he leaves it to the human being to say, now the rest of the work is left up to us. Are we going to move towards our desires or are we going to restrain our desires? Because fasting is a symbol, it's a metaphor for staying away from something halal, which means that we should also, outside of the month of Ramadan, everybody's heard this before, be able to stay away from something that is haram. And so it is a month, the first thing to note is a month in which the, these, these uh, the, the, the uh, spiritual himma should start to increase because Allah actually makes it easier for us to get closer to him by facilitating the opening entirely of Jannah and completely closing out the doors of hell. And then the Prophet also told us that it is a month of immense, immense forgiveness. And this is not to be underplayed, that every single day in the month of Ramadan, from the minute the month enters, there is mercy that is being completely, that is being distributed throughout the heavens and the earth. And there are angels that are asking forgiveness for the believers simply because the believers are fasting. And the Prophet told us that in this month, five blessings are given to his ummah that were not given to ummahs before. The first blessing is that on the first night of the month of Ramadan, Allah gives a special gaze, a special nether to this ummah. And it is mentioned in other narrations that the one who gets this gaze will not be in a state of uh, wretchedness after that. The second, secondly, that the, the, uh, the smell that you accumulate while fasting, right, when, uh, kind of towards the end of the day, that Allah actually likes that smell. It's more beautiful to him than the smell of perfume or musk. Third, as we mentioned, the angels are making repentance for the believers while you and I are fasting. The angels are observing the fast and they're saying, literally seeking repentance for the believing men and women. And so again, they're helping us out in this journey. 
And then the fourth, as we mentioned, similar to the other to the other hadith, where Allah is actually telling and commanding heaven to prepare itself for the believers. And there's people in this month who may not have been going towards the direction of heaven, their life will change completely. And they will start going towards that direction. That's what it means when we say the doors, when, when it's mentioned that the doors of heaven are open and the doors of hell are closed, it's not like any single person here is going to heaven right now or, or God forbid, uh, going to Jahannam right now. We're in San Ramon. That's not possible, right? But it means that the, the correction happens. Someone is maybe headed in one direction. The door is open. There's a magnetic pull that's pulling the human being in that direction. And now the life starts to change. And there's many of people, their entire life completely changed in this month of Ramadan. That they were headed toward in a very, very, very wrong direction. Maybe they were caught up in doing something majorly, uh, majorly haram, whether it's, it's drugs or partying or alcohol or whatever else it might be. And then the direction shifted. And the one thing to note here is that if Allah is being very, very merciful in this month for us to be merciful with ourselves and especially our children and our family members. That this is not a month in which we, uh, should try to remind them of all the bad that they that somebody does. It's like, oh, once Ramadan ends, you'll keep doing this this bad thing. It's like, no, 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 no. This is a month to try to encourage people to to tap into the to the greater part of themselves, right? And this is what the Prophet Islam is encouraging us to do. And lastly, he mentioned the fifth thing that is given to the believers on in the month is that on the final night, everybody is forgiven in their entirety. And they asked him, he says, is this is this Laylatul Qadr? Is this the night of power? And he said, no, this is different than the night of power. That has its own blessings. He said, this is a night that just like when a worker finishes their work, they receive their wage. This is the, the wage that, you know, the, the, this is the wage that someone is getting, right? This, this idea of complete, complete forgiveness. And so here we see that the, the month is a month of mercy. It's a month of forgiveness. And most importantly, it's a month of change. It's a month of us thinking through what have, what's gotten into our hearts in the last year that we're not happy with and where are we at spiritually compared to where we want to be and what are we going to do practically to try to change, right? Everybody, when it comes to their, their school, um, their college, a master's program or their career, most people have goals that they set. Like, I want to do this. I want to get to this level. I want to get this type of grade. I want to be promoted here. I want to make this much, whatever it is. And usually we work really, really hard to try to get to that, right? To try to achieve those goals. Ramadan is meant to be a spiritual boot camp, a spiritual boot camp for the believer to say, hold on, there's other goals that are, that are much more important than the goals we usually focus on. These are spiritual goals. These are, this is Allah now saying, time to take a break, a little bit of a break, take a little bit of a step back from everything else and really focus on me, right? And this does not have to be like a lot of quantity. The most important thing in Ramadan is quality, especially in the time that we live in. We're really, really, really busy with so much going on. But it's a time of quality change that we should find a few things inside of ourselves that we want to work on this month, right? The, the, the advice that many of the scholars give is pick one trait, one trait that you and I have that's, we're, that, we don't, that we're not satisfied with and work on that trait. Because if you can change one bad trait in, a, in the month of Ramadan, that trait that's transformed will stick with you, inshallah, for the rest of your life. It will pay off dividends for the rest of your life, right? And if you don't know any, any, you feel like you have no bad traits, you can just ask, you know, our spouses, and I'm sure they'll have a list of the traits, and then we can pick which one to work, right? Or our family, right? But you, we all know something or another that we have to work on. And we should know that the religion of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is a religion of character. It is a religion of akhlaq. It's not a religion of just doing acts of worship and then being a rude person or being a jerk. That's not the point of this religion. That if the acts of worship are not, are not transforming the soul and we're not becoming better people and we're not becoming kind and gentle and merciful and compassionate with our families and our children and our spouses and so on, it's, we're doing something wrong, right? And the month of Ramadan is supposed to be a month in which that mercy is not, it's Allah is giving us that mercy so that we can also distribute the mercy. We should, we're, we, we, we we're supposed to also become more compassionate, more expansive, more magnanimous, more generous in this blessed month of, um, of Ramadan. And so keeping that in mind that it is a month of forgiveness and a month of mercy and a month of change and ideally a month where we pick specific things that we, uh, want to be doing, right? That we want to, um, that we want to work on, inshallah. 
Then there's the famous ayah in the Quran that when Allah commands the believers to fast, right? That ya amanu kutiba alaykum as that, that fasting has been prescribed for you, like it was prescribed for those who came before you, la'allakum tattaqun, in order that you might attain the state of taqwa, the state of being ever mindful of Allah and realizing that God is always with you and is always watching and is always listening and is ever present. And that is, again, one of the deeper goals of fasting. It, when the believer is, or when, when, when somebody, for the sake of Allah, limits their food intake and their water intake and their stomach is empty, that opens up a door to the, to the spiritual realm that they did not have access to before. And it opens up a door to connection that was also not easily accessible before, but somebody has to be paying attention. Someone has to be paying attention. And what I mean by paying attention, that we have to be aware while we're fasting. The goal of fasting is not to make it to star time and then to eat five times as much as we would have eaten. That's not the goal. The goal of producing hunger, as Imam al-Ghazali defines it, that you actually start to become more astute, more clear in thinking, and your spirituality becomes stronger. And the spiritual eye that's within every human being, every human being has something called basira, the inner eye. The inner eye becomes stronger through the act of fasting. And that inner eye is what connects you and me to the spiritual realm that's, that, that exists. And the, the goal of fasting and one of the goals of accessing the state of taqwa is to start to feel access to that spiritual realm. It's not just to, to be hungry and then to, 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 to be hungry, tired, and, and cranky. That's, that's definitely not the goal of the month, right? What, when somebody is in this state of hunger, that access becomes more accessible. And then there's people who, well, outside the month of Ramadan, they try to keep their stomach light in order to keep this access very, very present. And this is the Sunnah of the Prophet but then would, it was not, it was not common for the Prophet or for the Sahaba to be eating often. Right? Very few meals, what, one to, one to two meals a day. Most of the Prophets would eat like one meal a day, and then the, the companions would have two meals a day, according to what uh, most of the scholars say. Because they, they, it was a goal to keep things light. It wasn't supposed to be all about consumption. The idea is you keep like a little bit of food in order to keep your back straight. If you must, one third food, one third water, and one third room in there for, for air and for breathing and so on. And so the fa fasting is supposed to bring us back towards that because it's not part of the nature of the human being to always be eating. It's part of the nature of Western society to always be eating and snacking and fast food and so on, but it's not part of the nature of the human being to always be eating. And you'll notice a difference in your spiritual state when food becomes a primary focus because the idea of you and you are what you eat is very very present in our in our tradition and so it's very closely linked to taqwa and one of the ways to, to identify how you and I are doing with our state of taqwa is on one hand you have heedlessness by right? just just kind of not being aware of God and constantly um, uh, slipping up and falling into things you shouldn't be falling into and the other end is the state of taqwa which is to, you can be defined as being really really careful about doing staying away from wrong and doing what's right, right? So when this pandemic first started, I mean, now there's people are careful, but when the pandemic first started, you literally had like, everybody was super careful with distancing and with wearing masks and with washing hands and with being in, in hand sanitizer and staying away from anybody who might have been um, exposed or staying away from anybody who might have had any symptoms. That is taqwa personified in, 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 in one way, right? But taqwa spiritually is to do that level of carefulness, but with your theme. To be really, really careful. I can't, I can't watch this. It's gonna mess my eyes. It's gonna mess my heart up. I can't listen to this. I can't say this. I can't go here. I have to be careful, right? That's that's tough one. So the on one end you we have heedlessness, which is not being aware. On the other end is tough one. And then in the same spectrum you you have anxiety and you have tranquility. The more taqwa someone starts to attain, the more they get closer to this inner state of tranquility and peace. The inner state of feeling calm and feeling present with Allah is, is very much linked to tranquility. And then the more heedlessness that becomes present with somebody, the more restlessness that, that's accompanied. Constant restlessness, constant worry, constant stress, constant anxiety. So you won't see the people of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, Inna al Allah, la khawfun alayhum wa la That the awliya of Allah, the, the saints, the close friends of Allah, they are not ever worried or nor do they have fear. They're not in this state of worry, trepidation. They have problems, things come up, they have difficulties, but the worry doesn't go deep down inside right? because they're trusting that Allah is going to take care of it. It's a sign of progression spiritually 
when tranquility becomes the dominant state when things start to happen in our life. It's a sign of not progressing when we're constantly in a state of worry, constantly in a state of worry, constantly in a state of worry. One of the goals of Ramadan is to bring the human being back to the back to this to this to this reality. Because when when we go for an entire month without eating, we go for an entire month without drinking, we go for an entire month um, uh, while trying to ideally pray extra. All we're exposing ourselves to all of the spiritual light, all of the spiritual light, and that ideally results in a state of tranquility. Results in a state of calmness and tranquility. And so, so in this in this month of Ramadan, as we start to enter, one of the one of the first things that we can do is make significant intentions. But the Prophet ﷺ told us that actions are by their intention. Right. So just you and I first intending. Now the action. Inshallah, we already get the reward for the action just by making an intention. And then it's also been stated by one of the great imams that if you, when you make an intention, Allah opens 70 doors of, of divine facilitation <coughs> of tawfiq to be able to achieve that intention, intention. So the first thing is just intending. What do we mean by intending? Just literally, you can think it, you can write it down, you can articulate it, you can discuss it with somebody, but saying, I wish to do this, this, and this in this month. So the first intention we should make, of course, is to fast the entire month and to do it out of servitude uh, to Allah and out of love of Allah and to obey Allah. And then from there, we now start making our specific intentions that we want to try to fast in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that we want to try and, and, and work on our bad habits, that we want to try and increase in nearness to Allah, that we want to try and develop good habits, spiritual habits as well, that will allow us that we can continue after the month of Ramadan is over, and so on, right? We, we want and we intend to recite Quran, and we intend to to stand longer in prayer, and so on. But the main thing to focus on is whatever things we are struggling with spiritually, to use Ramadan as a time to work on those things. Everybody has their own challenges. Everybody knows their own sins that we're struggling with, problems we have, the attachments that we have, the desires that we're falling prey to. And Ramadan is a month where Allah is making it easy to work on that. Right? And there's not like one thing that one answer that's that's kind of present for um, for everybody. And so that's where the, the path of, of change right starts there. And then from there we, we keep in mind, okay, where how, how how am I doing on this path of heedlessness and and going to talk about, right? Like am I present or am I not present? And the more present we begin to be with Allah, the more we realize Allah is with us, the more we start to articulate um, in, in our daily actions, we start to remember Allah, right? This can be done by reciting a lot of the sunnah du'as the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam would recite when waking up, when leaving, putting on your clothing, when using the restroom, when making wudu, and so on, because the Prophet ﷺ was always present. He was always present. He was teaching us that when you do thicker with everything, you are present. And when you are present, Allah is present. Shaitan will be absent. But when you become absent, Shaitan becomes present. And now the Shayateen are trying to get with us and trying to trying to mess with us and trying to whisper things and trying to um, really make us move in the wrong direction. And so that's why presence is so important. And vicar literally means remembrance. And what are you trying to you only remember when you've forgotten something. Right? And one of the meanings of insan is the one who forgets. And so the human being, the insan, is the one who's forgotten. Allah gives us thicker to remember. Remember who? Remember him. And so Ramadan then is this month of a lot of remembrance, a lot of thicker. Because you're fasting and that's thicker. And you're praying and that's thicker. And then making dua and that's thicker. And then serving the family and that's thicker and so on. There's so much thicker going on. And ideally by the end you are now in a state of, ah yes, we remember that we need to be with Allah. We need to be present with Allah. We need to be mindful in, from the time that we start our day the time that we end our day that Allah is watching. And should I do something that would displease him? And maybe before Ramadan, yeah, sure, whatever. That wasn't the thought that occurred to our head. But after Ramadan or during Ramadan, we're like, no, 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 I can't be fasting. I probably shouldn't do that. And then ideally after Ramadan, it's like, no, of course I can't do that because I worked on it. I've, I've gotten more of that, right? And another way to evaluate is, ideally we should know that we are kind of progressing um, upward and an upward trajectory with our spirituality. So we should look back at how am I doing to where I was two or three years ago. And if it's literally the same, and that can be that can be measured by two or three things. How much character someone has, like how, how strong, uh, how many tra good traits someone has and how many bad traits someone has and kind of how, uh, how strong someone's character is. And then it can be measured by 
overall acts of worship and acts of obedience. Those are two kind of easy ways to, to measure. And if it's like same or less than it used to be, we gotta we gotta work on it, right? Because nobody would be satisfied in most other stages of life, in investments and in school and so on, of just being same or like trending down. Nobody is nobody's satisfied with that. So spiritually, this is the time to recalibrate. Hold on a second. Where am I at? Right? And where am I relative to where I want to be? There's really not that much time left. And Ramadan reminds us of that. It starts, and then it's like, oh man, it's gonna be a long month. I had 29, 30 days. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And you start it, and you're going, and you're going, and next thing you know, first 10 days are done. And you're like, oh man, the middle 10 days is gonna be a lot more. And then next thing you know, it's the last 10 nights, and it's like, Maybe we didn't even get through some of the goals that we had, or, or maybe we did. I don't know. But it moves quickly. And it's supposed to be a metaphor for life, that it's supposed to go by really, really fast without us sometimes even having a chance to realize what's going except the one who's present. The one who's present will be, they'll know in every moment, Alhamdulillah, Allah is with me, Allah is watching me, and now I'm trying to make sure that I live my life in a way that Allah will be uh, pleased. So with that, we'll go ahead and get into the into the next um, section. I guess I guess I'll pause there. If anybody has any questions thus far, so there's three levels of, of fasting that that um, the, the the scholars lay out, the ulama lay out specifically Imam Ghazali. There's what's called the like basic fast. There's the more um, advanced fast, and then there's the super advanced fast. So we'll start with the, the basic fast. The basic fast is literally not eating anything from, from, from when Fajr enters until sunset, not drinking anything, and then not engaging in conjugal relations. That's the basic fast. When that fast is, is uh, when someone does that, they fulfill the basic fast, right? They, that person may have done a, you know, been angry and rude to somebody, and da, 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 but they fulfill the basic fast. That they, they did not let anything enter their body, uh, their body cavities, and they did not engage in, in relations. That's that's supposed to be easy, right? It's supposed to be okay. Everybody's supposed to do this, right? It's physically challenging, but there's no like extra um, effort necessarily that someone is putting in beyond the basic level. But alhamdulillah, that fulfills the fasting requirement from a fit perspective. Then there's what's called the fast of the people who are like they're they're actively trying to work on themselves spiritually. That is the fast of the limbs, the fast of the limbs, meaning that that person is fasting, of course, with their from, from food and from water and from, of course, engaging relations during the day. But they are also now keeping the fast of the eye, the fast of the ears, and the fast of the tongue, at minimum, and then we'll talk about the other limbs. What are these fasts? So the fast of the eye is the fast of staying away from looking at anything at all. So if someone sees an inappropriate image, lowering their gaze. If someone sees um, a lot of violence that's happening, that's that's also not permissible to look at, they, 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 they lower their gaze, right? If somebody is seeing something um, uh, going on that is wrong, they help out, right? That would be, now the eye is in the state of fasting. The fasting of the ear, similarly, is if somebody is hears something, and that, that would be haram, that they turn it off, or they try to try to move move from it, right? So um, mo most music these days, especially the vulgar music, right, that would not be advised to listen to generally, but especially in the month of Ramadan, because everything you and I hear, everything you and I see, it makes an exact perception of the heart spiritually. And this is actually one of the main problems in our times that a lot of people are struggling se severely, severely with depression and with anxiety because society as a whole has forgotten that Everything we heard and saw growing up makes a spiritual impact. And when the heart becomes impure, the first things to kick in are severe amounts of worry, angst, depression, anxiety. I'm not saying that's the only reason, of course, but those are some of the main reasons that, that, that it happens, right? And so anything that we see, any haram image that we see, it makes an imprint on the heart. Any haram image that we listen to, it makes an imprint on the heart. And it literally, Imam Ghazali says, it's like a drawing that's embedded. And now you have to find ways to erase it. Right, so like the, the vulgar music that's misogynistic, that's encouraging violence and all these other things, the heart has taken that trait on. It's like to put that dress on. The haram images someone is looking at that takes it on, right, and so on. And so that fasting of the eye, that's what we mentioned, the fasting of the ear, 
and then the, and, and the ear would also apply to listening to um, you know someone's gossiping, someone starts backbiting. We we want to leave, right? Because the ear, it's impermissible to let that stuff get inside of your ear. It's like it's like uh, toxins. You don't want that in your in your in your body, right? And you don't want that spiritually affecting you. And then um, the the tongue, and the tongue would be, let's say actually backbiting ourselves, right? So backbiting and gossiping, those would be considered, they're haram anytime, but in Ramadan, we want to be especially careful. That's considered the level of fasting of the tongue. And then it would be um, to curse, right? To say, to say you know, impermissible language, to lie, um, all, all of these types of things, right? And then there's an even higher level within each of these, that some people, they're at the point where they're like, okay, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not doing the, the, the haram with my tongue, with my eye, or with my with my tongue, or with my ear, and I'm also going to make sure I'm not wasting any time with it because it's a month that I want to fast from anything that is um, uh, that is that is not uh, a good use of time. I'm trying to try to fast from. But there are people who go to this this studio. They're like, okay, well, I'm not going to just like let myself watch TV because there's no benefit to it. So I'm I'm going to try to make sure to use that extra time to do what to recite Quran. Or to be with my family and to just be present, or to do some dhikr, or to make du'a, because I don't want that getting in my eye. I'm trying to fa- keep the fast of the eye, right? And then I'm not going to just try to let myself listen to vain talk, talk that's empty, just not really beneficial. I'm going to try to stay away from it. Right? You just, you, doesn't mean if someone starts and coming up and talking to you about something, like, I can't listen to it. No, no. I mean, you just generally like I'm, you don't try to engage in those types of conversations. That would be a higher degree, right? But that has to be done, you know. With, with um, in a, in an intelligent and wise way, not done in a, in a way that would, of course, you know, turn someone else um, off. And so that same thing that applies to the limbs, the other limbs, to the hand and to the feet, what's mentioned with the hands, anything, not 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 um, touching anything that would be impermissible or not um, uh, uh, hurting anybody, obviously, physically, with your hands. And then with the feet, right, not walking towards anything or, or heading anywhere, or I guess driving anywhere, that would be um, impermissible, and that would be hard to go to. And this is surprisingly a month in which you might have somebody who, outside of the month of Ramadan, is going to all sorts of haram places, right? But in as the month of Ramadan kicks in, something happens, and they're like, no, 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 no I gotta stop. Right? I gotta stop. I knew I knew many people like this in college, right? And it was like, no, no, no Ramadan, nothing, no, no partying, can't do any of that. And so the feet got used to not going, and said instead of going toward the the party, they went towards the masjid. And then that happened one day, and then the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And then by the end, it was like, oh, I don't need any of that anymore. The person literally became transformed. And they're just like, well, I might as well just try to go more towards this the masjid. Because the heart, the transformation happened. Remember, the limbs are linked directly to the heart. Whatever the limbs do, the heart is going to um, be affected. And so if you train yourself to say, no, 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 I can't do that. But you just force yourself to say, okay, I'm going to the masjid every night. We'll keep it up after a month of Ramadan, right? Alhamdulillah, it's amazing to play to pray Salat al-Tarawi, but it's also very, very amazing to play Salat al-Isha every night in congregation, right? That should be should be habits that we start in Ramadan and then we keep outside of the month of Ramadan because you trained yourself already, right? And it's and you're kind of in that rhythm, you're in that in that pattern. So that is the um, uh, at a high level, that is the. Um, fast of the limb. So that's the, the kind of the higher level, right? Someone is like saying, okay, I'm going to try more than doing the basics. And so each of us should pick one or two of these things you just mentioned and try to really, really carefully guard ourselves from them. Now, for the people who are doing this fast, for them, it's like if they fall into this, they treat it as though, oh, man, like I'm losing a lot of reward in my fast. Your fast by the law point of view is not broken, right? It's like if you get an argument, the fast isn't broken by the law, but the reward is significant. Right? If someone catches, doesn't lower their gaze and looks at something impermissible, doesn't mean the fast is gone, but the reward is significantly reduced. So these people, they're like, okay, I'm going to really try to maintain the highest level of reward with my fast by being super, super careful about what I say, about not letting my anger come out, about what I look at, about what I listen to, about where I go, and so on. And through that, character development happens, and someone starts to become a better human being. And again, one of the goals of this month is to try and be change, and when you start to become a better human being, your taqwa increases. When your taqwa increases, you become a better human being. It's this, this, this really, really amazing opportunity to try and improve. Alhamdulillah, honestly, if Allah didn't make this mandatory for us, 
really, who would ever do this, right? Who would just be like, oh, I'm just going to not eat for 30 days straight, and I'm just going to pray a lot. And gonna, and most people would just be like, yeah, yeah, maybe for like a weekend. But it wouldn't be like a concentrated thing. Alhamdulillah that Allah knew that, you know what, most of us are going to be so caught up and so busy with work and family and school and da 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 that we just, he's like, no, you need to just take a little bit, keep doing those things, but try and now focus in this month, do some extra in this, in this direction because it's going to benefit you. And we have to remember fasting doesn't benefit God at all. There's no benefit to Allah, any worship that you and I do. It's not, it's not for him. Like it's not to benefit him rather. It's so that we can show Allah, you know what? You know what's good for me. And he knows this is good for us. And it's to show him that out of our love for you and because we want to obey you, we're doing this. Right? And, and, and it only benefits us at the end of the day. Again, it has no benefit to Allah. And then there is the fasting of the elite. The elite. Elite, in this case, are people who are like, their real spirituality is that's their whole game. And they're like really, really into it. And that is for them the fasting of their trying to maintain a state where it's, you go from from um, uh, food control to controlling your limbs to controlling your thoughts. Those are the kind of levels. And so these people now, they're at the point of their thoughts are being controlled. So they're like, they don't, they try not to let themselves have thoughts outside of thoughts about Allah. They only want to have thoughts about Allah. That their fasting for them is, they're like, any thought that comes in that's a worldly thought or that's a distracting thought, they're like, now my fasting reward, right? For them, and this is not, again, according to the, this is just for their own um, uh, own selves, you could say, right? But they're like, now I, I'm, I'm reducing my reward in my fast. And so this is called the fasting of the elite. This would be the fast of the um, the greatest people of this Ummah. That they're, that they're really, really present in the month of Ramadan. Now, for most of us, obviously, that's, you know, we're not going to be able to do that. But what we, we can do that for maybe 10 minutes. Right? We can do that for 20 minutes or for a few hours, right? We should try to take a portion of each of these and implement them. That there should be portions of time, at least one of the last 10 nights in the month of Ramadan for one hour, we really try not to think about anything other than Allah. And it's actually really hard. Someone could be reading Quran and then this thought comes in about work and then this thought comes in about, about our you know families and then this thought comes in, oh, what am I going to eat for breakfast tomorrow? And then all these different thoughts come in. And next thing you know, you, you were doing dhikr, but we can't control the thoughts. But there are people who this month becomes a month of really, really being so present that the thoughts now begin to become much more um, controlled. And that's a, that's a state that we should try to aspire to. It's not, not easy, of course, but it's a state, a state that we should try to aspire to even for a little bit of time. So we're gonna we're gonna touch a little bit kind of on some of the practical things that we can start to do now to achieve what we just discussed. Um, and I'll pause there for any questions that anyone might have. And if there's a question on the sister side, I won't be able to see, so someone will need to just flag that. Any questions yet? Okay. So. Then one of the main things that will help with what, the, the, uh, what we just mentioned, like trying to go from this, these levels, is to limit how many the things are going to distract us in this month. And so one, one piece of advice that scholars recommend that I have for myself and for all of, for all of us, inshallah, is to really try to make this Ramadan a, a time where we also fast from media. To try to have at least a portion of this month where we fast from media. Because the majority of the month, we're, we're on our phones, watching Netflix, watching movies, on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Snapchat, on Discord, on ev all the different applications, all the different apps, right? And we're something on playing video games online. Something is constantly, constantly entering. Now, when something is, when you and I constantly have something entering us, right, it becomes very, very difficult for us. It becomes very, very difficult for us to be present with our own thoughts because you, you're not, you, you, we aren't allowing ourselves to be present, right? I remember earlier today, I was like thinking about something and I was like trying to, I was like, yeah, I should probably think about this. And then I was like, oh, let me just read the news. Let me just see what's going on. And then I was like, wait, no, but I need to think about this thing. I should not read it. It was like, literally, I didn't even let myself have some time to think because, because I just wanted to go and whatever, read, read the most recent news that's going on, right? Or check out, check my email, whatever it is. We have so many notifications so many things that we are constantly, constantly, constantly being um, impacted by. And I think most of us don't realize we're being impacted. And so it's very difficult to be spiritually present and spiritually 
to, to gain spiritually when there's so many distractions. And so for ourselves and for our families, we should try to make a commitment. Okay, what level of media control can we bring to ourselves in Ramadan? For the people who want to have a, of a, of a more lofty goal, try to just turn the, the television off, the, most of the, of the extra time on devices. Obviously, communication and whatnot is important, but the extra time is off completely. That would be like an, a good aspirational goal to have. Because it's not really a month where the angels are go, all coming by, by and whatnot, and then like, we're watching CNN, and like, they're like, oh, this house, I should probably leave, right? Like, I don't want to watch CNN. Um, so the, the, but we, these realities are taking place. And there's also people who witness these realities. They're, they're so in touch with their spirituality that they're able to witness what's going on. But we're so distracted by everything that's going on and by media being the primary distraction that we ha are becoming out of touch with these things. We're becoming out of touch. And we just, we kind of just do stuff ritualistically and formulaically, right? And so limiting media will have a major impact spiritually in this Ramadan. So try to kind of come up with some type of the three, three, three things, right? Television, social media, and then just general phone use. Those three things for ourselves and for our children. This is not, uh, parents, one thing I would not advise is imposing this on your children and then not doing it yourself, right? So they're like, yeah, no, you can't do any of this. And meanwhile, watching television and then doing this and scrolling on our own Facebook, but kids know TV, it's Ramadan, right? No, no, no. It has to have to walk the walk and talk the talk, right? So, um, or, or walk the talk, I should say. So that we want to make sure that we try to come up with some agreement as a family to say, you know what, let's all try to do this. And if we can't do it for 30 days, okay, try to do it for at least the last 10 the last 10 nights, right? And at least, at least at nighttime in the last 10 nights. The last 10 nights, for sure, the nighttime should not be a time where we're on meet, we're on social media and we're watching television and movies and so on. Because those are especially times, it could be the night of power and the night where a thousand, so you'll get a reward for a thousand months of movies, right? Instead of a thousand months of worship. I mean, we want to, we want to um, really be mindful of these things. And the more we're in touch we are with our spiritual side, the more touch we will be at the end of the day with what matters most which is the hereafter and that's that's part of the goal of of our life is to slowly 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 not be so obsessed with this world and to try to be much more in touch with the next world and so you know the, the, the television netflix that kind of all falls into one hulu all the streaming services um uh, yes disney plus as well and then the second one right our social media and try to reduce that and come up with goals for ourselves. If we're like on it two, three hours a day, try to reduce it. We, and you'll see how much time we, you have, right? Sometimes it's like, oh, it's very, very difficult to do a whole khatam of Quran. Uh, maybe it takes 30 minutes to recite one uh, 30th of the Quran, one Joseph of the Quran. 30 minutes is sometimes hard to find, but when you take media out, you're like, oh, I got three hours back in the day, right? There's a lot of time. You know, you could, someone goes and recites like four, four khatams of the Quran because of how much time that they had back. Right? That might be hard to do immediately, but it's so possible. And then what happens? Someone starts to realize the value of time. In Ramadan, when time is used wisely, outside of Ramadan, time becomes filled with barakah. Because that, that, the, the, the blessings that started in Ramadan extend then outside of the month. Extend outside of the month. And so if, if we already have a lot of these kind of basic things now that we mentioned, this is now something we should aspire to. It's slightly more advanced, but that we should try to um, aspire to it and reduce it. Um, if we can reduce it, reduce it. If we can eliminate it for the month, eliminate it. And that will have immense, immense spiritual um, benefits, inshallah. So we'll go ahead and I think we have about 15, 20 minutes left for the show. So we'll go ahead and um, and, and get into some of the uh, thick now of the of the month of Ramadan. I guess just pausing there again. Any questions thus far? Um, actually, right before we get into the into the thick, we'll we'll, I, we'll outline some of the special times in the month of Ramadan, like of the day, and kind of a good schedule that we should try to have. So, ideally, what, that we should all try to be up in the morning at suhoor, right? At suhoor, the, the it's very very important. Prophet Sam said there is a special blessing in that meal, and it is a time when we already know the time before Fajr per various hadith is a time when du'a is accepted. And it is, it is, it is the, usually the time of the Hajjud, right, outside of the month, uh, and in the month of Ramadan. But in the month of Ramadan, specifically, it's the time for us to be eating the pre-dawn meal. And if we are, if we have gotten into a habit of eating, eating at night and sleeping through that, 
we should try to try try not to. That would be considered straying away from the Sunnah of the Prophet Islam. It would not be considered something that is um, uh, that would be recommended at all, right? That we would we were changing what the religion has asked us to do. Um, so what we should try to make sure we're present at that time. And then on certain days, try and stay pray Fajr in congregation, right? And then try to stay awake until Ishraq. Ishraq is is the time when sun rises. So about like seven ten these days. Um, and to try to pray two rakahs after Ishraq, or about, about uh, 10, 20 minutes after Ishraq, of what's called Salat al Duha. And um, that, that the person who prays Fajr in congregation and does uh, thicker between the time of Fajr and the time of, of sunrise, and then prays these two rakah, they get the reward of a complete Hajj and Umrah. Complete Hajj and Umrah. And the Prophet told us in Ramadan, acts are multiplied 10 times, up to 70 times, up to more than that. So there's people who are literally getting the reward of 10 to 70 hajjas and umrahs every morning because they're doing this every single day in the, in the month of Ramadan. These are the extra shortcuts. It's, it's pretty hard sometimes with work to do this. So at least on the weekends, right? At least on the weekends to try and do these extra boosts, right? And then we should also make sure that, and obviously in addition to taking advantage of the time throughout the day, that at least the 5 to 15 minutes before Maghrib comes in, before Iftar, that we are present and making the du'a. Do not let a star come in and again that the TV is on or that we're just talking and hanging out and, and then next thing you know, the sunset. This is a time to be present. This is a time when dua is accepted. This is a time to be asking Allah. It's like if you've been knocking, 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 knocking on the door and the door opens and you just run away. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Right? Now the door is open to ask. So we should ask at this time and at least be present for a few minutes before. So I would advise that everybody has, try to gather as a family at the table and before, before breaking um, the fast, to try and do a collective du'a. And if that's not possible, to at least do it kind of on, our, on our own. But presence at this time is really, really important. If at least these two times of the day we can be present, and then of course taking, you know, prioritizing our prayers throughout the rest of the day, ins inshallah we will be um, good at taking advantage of the day. And then it comes to the taking advantage of the night, of which the um, praying Isha in congregation is essential in this month, especially for men. Essential in this month to pray Isha in congregation. It is an emphasized sunnah of the Prophet throughout the year to pray Isha in congregation. It's more important to pray Isha in congregation than to pray Taraweeh at all. Right? Isha in congregation, so to, 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 to come to Taraweeh and you were late and then we quickly rush through Isha so we get to Taraweeh, that would be like that would be inverted, right? Isha is the more important prayer to pray in congregation. And if someone cannot stay for the rest of Taraweeh, okay, but try to catch at least Isha and maybe another few rakahs, and then, and then head back, and then try, try to also do so with praying Fajr in congregation. And if someone cannot do this, you know, in the masjid, to do so at home, but congregation um, at home with our families, inshallah. So we'll briefly cover then the, um, the thick of the, uh, the month of Ramadan. So the first, the first thing is when, when to stop eating, right? So Sahur, so the, the, the uh, morning time, the morning meal, and ideally a few minutes before Fajr comes in, we stop eating. I would not recommend being drinking water and getting the last sip in and then Fajr has entered. That's really, really, really risky. At that point, if it's entered, the fast is invalid. And you don't want to take risks with your fast, right? And some, we don't, you don't want to like, like fasting is not done on Muslim standard or basic standard time. It's done on, the time that Allah has prescribed it to be done, right? So that that five to six minutes before, just stop eating. And if that's not possible, someone just woke up. Okay, two three minutes before, but like definitely once since like two one or two minutes before, all the food water should be should be put away, and someone should be preparing themselves um, or cleaning up or whatever, preparing themselves for fajr. But ideally, to try and um, make sure to to do that. Right? And then for iftar, this is done. Alhamdulillah, that, that this masjid does this. Uh, but not all massages do this. If star comes in five minutes, three to five minutes after the sunset time that you see on your iPhones, okay? If star is not the time that you see on your iPhone, if you go and you drive, let's say you're on like the 80 near the water by Berkeley, and you're driving and your phone says it's sunset, so it's Maghrib, like 725 today, you literally see the sun hasn't gone down. The sun is like like this much in the air still because they're doing it based on astronomical sun sun sunset. It's not Maghrib time at that point. So do not break your fast at that time. Add three, three, three to five minutes, at least three minutes. To, and I think again, the calendars that the masjid gives here, that's already done. But if you're relying on the phones, um, just be super, super um, careful of this. Because again, these are um, basically, you want the sun to have gone down completely 
below the horizon, right? The sun has gone down below the horizon. And at that point, three minutes after what your phone says, you should be, you should be clear. Inshallah. Then, um, and again, I already mentioned this, at this point, this is the time to be making du'a. But you don't also delay for like 20 minutes, right? You don't just be like, oh, I gotta be super good. Once you, you know, okay, three to five minutes pass, bismillah, open the, open the fast. And then, um, so then we'll get to what, what does, what invalidates the fast? So there's two types of fast, two types of invalidation of the fast. Of, uh, the first is invalidation that requires what's called kafara. This is a type of invalidation which kafara means 60 days of continuous fasting to expiate, to just basically saying sorry to God, right, for making that big, big mistake. These are three things. The first is eating um, something on purpose. And just like someone's fasting and they're like, oh, I'm thirsty, you drink water. Or, 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 or eat like, oh, they, they, they drive by some, you know, they smell the french fries and I'm going to go get some vegetables. That requires how you, you have to make up the fast and you have to do 60 days to, to of expiation, right? And that's preferred to 60 days and then if someone cannot do that, to feed 60, to feed 60 people. Second is if someone engages in um, uh, like relationships on purpose, right? Um, that someone, and, and this has to be uh, that kind of the full, you know, there's the full relationship, there's children in the room, so everybody generally knows what I'm talking about here. And then the third is if um, somebody, again, intentionally also, like, let's say it's raining and someone's like, I'm so thirsty, and they're just like trying to catch the rainwater, like anything done intentionally. It's not like only, you know, done um, with a meal, like anything done intentionally, anything entering you intentionally, right? And this can be, be really, really careful about little things that, that could enter the body, any body cavity intentionally, because that will require, um, uh, that, that will require, uh, will anything entering the mouth, I should say, that will require the, the 60 day expiation. Then there is what's called a fast that um, you have to make it up, but you don't require the 60 days, right? So there's the, the 60 days. That would be that if somebody, um, like, like, I don't know, bites their nails and they get a little bit of something of dirt in them. And that, the fast is broken. Something has entered the cavity at that point. But the, um, the, uh, it does not require expiation, right? The second is if somebody is, while is making wudu or doing ghusl and is like rinsing, rinsing, and then you know water goes down. You're, you are sure water went down. At that point, the fast is broken, but you're not required to, uh, make this through the 60 days. You just have to make up that one fast. The fast is broken. And the, the way the law works there is you have to finish the fast and you have to make up the fast. Um, so it's, 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 uh, uh, you finish the fast for that day. It's not like, oh, water went down and go eat a burger. It's like, no, no, the fast is, the fast is invalid, but someone has to note that down and, um, make it up, right? And then if someone is like forced to break the fast, right? Like, like that, inshallah, will never happen. But God forbid if it did, it's important to, uh, it's important to know. If somebody has um, uh, that intentional, um, so if somebody has a, let's say, a wet dream, that's not, if that, the fast is not um, invalid at that point. But if it happens due to anything intentional, the fast is invalid. And someone has to make that fast up. But again, it does not require 60 days. Um, and then uh, anything else that enters the, uh, the cavities of the body, right, the fa it's required to... Uh, make up the, the fast, but like eye drops and stuff like that are, are okay. They're, they're like nose drops that are going in that could go in that would be um, considered at least in Hanafi school not not ideal. Yeah. So those, I mean, those are really the, the 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 main the main rules. It's not like that complicated. Alhamdulillah, Allah has made it easy. The main other thing to note about traveling, at least in the Hanafi school, um, traveling when fasting is if somebody has set out for the travel before Fajr is coming. If you are traveling at 3 p.m. that day, you start the day fasting. You, you, you are fasting that day. You do not break the fast if your flight or whatever is at 3 p.m. that day. You set out before, this again, according to the Hanifah school, I don't know the rulings of the other schools, um, but you, you have set out right before the, the time of uh, the time of Fajr. So it's important, these, these rules, they take like 20 to 30 minutes to learn. It's pretty, but it's really important because entire fasts can be Invalid. I remember somebody told me once that they thought if they didn't wake up for suhoor, that they didn't have to fast. Right? It was like, well, they don't have to fast that day. They didn't wake up. And so then many days go by and Ramadan just, oh, well, didn't wake up, so they don't have to fast. So that's, 
that would be. I mean, I can I can see where somebody might think that, but of course that's not correct, right? That you have, fasting is happening regardless if someone wakes up or not. Um, but of course, we should try to wake up because it's going to help us with energy, and it, it is a sun that we call the And um, the there is again like difference of opinion on things like brushing teeth and toothpaste and so on. The, the main thing is like try to just if you if you're uh, trying to be careful, just brush your teeth before before um, so word comes in before fudger comes in. If you're you know with with toothpaste, no, just so you're extra careful, nothing goes in, and then brush it again. Um, you know, after after it's dark. Uh, but the main thing is just try to be scrupulous, try to be careful. You don't want to put your fast at risk, right? You don't want to put your fast at risk. And then another thing to avoid is if someone does not usually eat um, uh, like zabiha meat in Ramadan, do not break your fast with non zabiha meat. That would also be considered, um, you, you've, you've gotten all these spiritual benefits from staying away from food, right? So make sure that the food that you eat is is uh, slaughtered according to the rights of Islamic law during during uh, I did of course every time but if someone is not doing that definitely in the uh, month of Ramadan and lastly with regards to Tarawi and sorry we're just kind of touching on a few random points here because um, we're coming up on time with regards to Tarawi Tarawi of course is very very important in the time that we live in if someone has a lot of makeup prayers to do I mean that you know we just haven't prayed. Or if we have like a ton of certain prayers we miss, like we just always miss Fajr, we always miss Maghrib or whatever it is. In the Maliki school, the Hanbali school, and the Shafi school, it's preferred to make up your prayers versus doing Taraweeh. That it is more preferred to make up your prayers. And so just keep keep that in mind that um, in the Hanafi school, you have to they say do both, like how to do Taraweeh and make up prayer. But you have to take in this, in the time we live in, Allah, and this is not, uh, this is just my, my understanding and what I feel like makes sense in the time we live in. That it's really, really prioritized the debts you have to do to Allah because it's very difficult to find time throughout the year where someone is going to do like a few dozen prayers a day. It's very difficult to find time. So if you have a lot of fajrs or a lot of other prayers to make up, prioritize making up those prayers. I would highly, highly, highly encourage prioritizing making up those prayers. Um, and then, and then if someone, of course, mashallah, already has all their prayers made up and um, and, and they're in that, then then, then of course to pray. Tarawi, but Tarawi is also, it is an emphasized sunnah. And so what that means is it shouldn't be left without unless someone has an excuse, right? And that doesn't mean Tarawi in the masjid. You can do 20 rakah at home, but just do pray extra in this month. That's really, really important. I'm just keeping in mind to, to, to try and pray extra in this month. So Alhamdulillah, it's a, it's a very, very important month. It's a month of, uh, of worship. It's a month of mercy. It's a month of forgiveness. It's a month of du'a being accepted. It is a month of change. It is a month of immense, immense blessings. And so we should try to just make strong intentions to try to work on ourselves in this month and try and make strong intentions to try and transform, inshallah, in this month. And add any little bit of good that we can to our lives but that we will consistently do, hopefully, after the month of uh, of Ramadan. And to try to do some light review, again, on the rules and the things that it is that we need to do. And inshallah, Allah will make the month full of blessings and barakah um, for us. If anybody has questions, we'll just do a few minutes of questions. Yes? So I'm seven years old. So how do I fast? MashaAllah, you're seven years old. So you you don't have to fast. But if you want to and you want to practice, you can do a fast for like half the day and then you can eat lunch and then fast again for the other half of the day. Yeah. But when you're seven years old, there's no need to fast, especially when these days are long because Islam makes things easy for people. So you don't want to fast when... Um, it's going to be difficult for you. You're, you're growing. You need nutrients right now. So, so you know, I would not recommend um, doing the full day fast. But you can do half day, have lunch, and then do the rest if you want. Yeah. But you should pray because you're seven. Mashallah. Allah bless you. Any other questions? Okay. Did you say if you have eyes off? Um, yeah, eye drops are fine. Yeah, yeah, eye drops are okay. That's awesome. Uh, yes. Brushing with the miswak. Brushing, yeah, brushing with the siwak is totally fine. Yeah, brushing with the the miswak, the tooth stick, uh, the sunna tooth stick is totally fine. Yeah, many of them someone wants. Anything else? Okay, if anybody has anything that. Um, they didn't get a chance to ask, we can 
ask afterwards. We'll just do a quick du'a. Call the adhan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik. Ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma ftahalina fatibu al-arifin wa fiqhna wa fiqhna salimin. Ya Arhamu al-Rahim wa la ilaha illa anhu subhanahu wa inni kuntu min al-Alameen. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Kareem, Ya Sari, Ya Fatah, Ya Allah, Ya Latif, Ya Allah, we ask Allah that you Ya Allah, accept us, Ya Allah, that you forgive us, and that you pardon us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, that you make this month of Ramadan immensely, immensely blessed for us and for our families and for the Allah, the Prophet, that you make this month a month of change, and a month of us drawing near to you, and a month of us detaching from this dunya, and a month of us detaching from our desires, and that we that we attach to you and only you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, make this a month in which that we pray abundantly, and that we make abundant dua, and that we recite abundant Quran, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and make it easy for us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, please put nur in this month and opening in this month and barakah in this month for all of us and for our loved ones. Ya Allah, for all the Muslims that are suffering throughout the world. Ya Rabbil Alameen, make this month a month of relief for the Muslims in Palestine and the Muslims in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Kashmir and in Syria and in Yemen and in Myanmar and in Libya and all of them and in Iraq and all of the other places. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, that the Muslims are suffering. Ya Allah, please help them. Ya Allah, Allah. Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, grant them immense relief in this month and make their fast easy for them. Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, make this a month that is full of barakah for us. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, in the month of Rahmah. Ya Allah, please make this a month in which you forgive our sins. Ya Allah, that you draw us nearer and nearer to you. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we struggle. Ya Allah, we struggle in our lives. Ya Allah, we struggle to prioritize you. Ya Allah, but make it possible for us to prioritize you. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask that you bless our children and our family members. Ya Allah, and the youth. Ya Rabbil Alameen, and make this month a month where they get closer and closer to you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Protect them from the fitna that are present in this society, Ya Allah. Protect them and ask for the fitna at the end of times, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you for everything good for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ask for and we ask you for protection from everything evil that he has protection from. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.